Visions, a history of the Royal School for the Blind, Liverpool. As told by three young people, two boys and a girl, and two older gentlemen. This takes the form of talking heads against a background of an optician's illuminated eye chart. Looking through the trees, we see a red brick Victorian building with steps leading up to a white door. Just walking through the front door to an unfamiliar place. You could feel the buzz and you could feel the happiness of everybody. A young person's hand running along a wood panelled wall. Walking on past a tiled pillar. I remember walking down the corridor, just being able to have that new feeling of, it's a new place, it's a new beginning. Portrait of a blindfolded Edward Rushton, 1756 to 1814. Edward Rushton was the person who was the founder of the Royal School for the Blind. He gone to work on pearls when he was 11, done six years of that, and then went blind, sadly. The young person's fingers running over the contours of a bronze bust of Edward Rushton. I'd say Edward Rushton was brave because he had obstacles to go through. And how he worked on the boats and helped all the black, black people and disabled people and fought for women's rights and stuff like that. The copy of a letter from Edward Rushton dated the 20th of February, 1797, to George Washington of Mount Vernon in Virginia on his continuing to be a proprietor of slaves. What I don't seem to be able to grasp is why any headmaster can't see why children of any like, disability can't have the same success. I am definitely proud of the fact a pen and ink sketch of a building. Liverpool had the first UK blind school and the second in the world. In the original School for the Blind, the children or young adults, whoever were there, they were only allowed to do whatever it is that was provided for them. A sepia photograph of a group of pupils in a shoemaking workshop. For example, like basket making, rope making, or whatever it is. A young person handling and smelling rope. It would have been hard for them. But if that's the only thing I could do, I'd probably do it. In them days, you still probably would have felt grateful. Honestly, I'd just turn around and refuse to go and do basket making. I just end up sitting in the house and not doing anything. Two older gentlemen sitting side by side. I went to what, the Waverley School for the Blind in the 50s. In, in those days, yes, you, you went into law, physiotherapy, um, and then the trade of it, piano tuning, shorthand typing, secretary work. I suppose in a way I'd feel very isolated because it's just that one thing. A young person playing a cello. They're not given an opportunity to expand more on what they love. Two buildings on a busy street. An inscription on a grey stone wall. This building was erected in 1931 on the site formerly occupied by the Chapel for the Blind. It's a tunnel between the school and the chapel. What people thought it was for was Blind and visually impaired people to make it easier for them to get from place to place. Through the door into a chapel, light falls onto the gothic arches of the altar. The door opens and a stream of people walk through. But what it was really for was for rich people to go back and forth so they could put money in a like, top or box or whatever it was. The priest was trying to promote the fact that this school needed money and it was their responsibility as rich people. A young person reads through the leather-bound cash ledger donations for the additional buildings. I would say it was a good thing 
because it gave them the money and it gave them a chance to expand on what they could do with the children within the school. A newspaper. In the background, a black and white photograph of a small boy. He was a little boy who was blind. The black and white posed photograph of a small boy wearing a frown and set mouth and holding on to a string lead. He had a pet cockle who was originally his friend and that eventually started to help him find his way around. In them days that would have been really helpful because these days you have like a giant dog to guide you about but in them days you wouldn't have had nothing. Some people or older children from him uh, rather cowardly stirred the cockle to death and left him on his own. And seeing that happen to something that's helped you would make you feel really sad and upset. A young person looking sympathetically at the photograph. And then that cockle was killed by horrible, ignorant bullies is very upsetting. So the only bit of bullying I really came across I'd say it would probably be when I was in year one, year two, because I couldn't sit, he wouldn't just come up to me and start punching me, he'd like come up and sneak up behind me and like do it and things like that. And they just wanted to be mean because the young boy was different. It almost sounds like the bullies didn't get that. A view outside Lime Street Station. You evacuated. Probably would have been scary, losing family and like leaving family. An extract from a diary. Our evacuation, September 1939. Normal sighted evacuees would have had a lot different feelings compared to blind and visually impaired evacuees. Close up of handwriting in black ink. We set off. With normal children, it's a case of get them all in a group and get them on the train. Four coaches. Pictures of stick people holding hands. But well, we're blind and visually impaired people, you need to make sure they know where they're going, know where they need to get on the train and when to get off. They don't have the same feeling and we'd be able to connect with the carers. A young person handling a grey rubber gas mask. You probably would have felt like kind of lost and not know what to do and things. Because my biggest fear is losing the people I love, which can relate to all of the evacuees because as I'm sure it was probably theirs as well. A young person opening an old white suitcase with painted red roses. The first time I left home for school was my year seven. A young person takes out a teddy bear. It has a white nose and mouth and black eyes with a bow at the neck. So that for me was quite a massive step that was very hard. It was different because you were away from home. I mean, when I was at junior school, I had, some of it was really quite unhappy because I wanted to be at home with me mum. It's better than it was because it's Monday to Friday, then I'm home for a full weekend and then I'm back again. But I love it here, so it's God. Off I go down to London, get the train down to Euston, um, had to get the, the, the underground down to Charing Cross, get a train out from Charing Cross to um, Elton Wellhall Station on the, the southeast edge of London, get a bus to the college, get, get to the college, round the duck pond into the place and waiting for interview. So I go in for interview and this person from the far corner speaks up. She said, um, can I ask Mr. McFarland, this blind person, how much of a burden are you going to be to other students? <laughs> no, in a sense, Blind and visually impaired people won't be a burden. And yes, we do need to be better than others, because if we're not, employers are just going to go for the ones that the safer option and not actually take a risk and go with a visually impaired person or maybe even a blind one. I don't think it would happen now, but then you still get people saying comments because I had a comment a couple months ago to me and yeah, so I think you still get other people out there with comments like that. Hearing Frank and Joe, they've like 
made me more determined. A young person holding a microphone and wearing headphones. So Joe, yes, you got an MBE. How did it come around of you getting an MBE? Um, how to know friends and influence people as well. <laughs> no, I was lucky. The biggest shock I ever got. I became involved with long cane mobility. A wooden frame holding long grey canes with balls on the tips. This was before the RNIB had, had got to any mobility centre. There was no long cane um, or a hoover cane as we called it in those days. A pair of fluorescent yellow trainers walks down a corridor with a long grey cane. It was actually a, a planned lesson, which was the perhaps the most important thing that we were doing. To help instruct uh, with long cane was one of the most important, vital um, facets of education for blind people. So the feeling of having a cane with you makes your body more, well, I'd say it makes the blind person more safe, well, feel more safer. You just learnt your way around and you learnt to get around so that you didn't sit down around doing nothing. So different lifestyles, certainly, but um, there were lots of advantages of going to a special school. And you, you are always willing to do it because you you had this empathy with the kids. One of the older gentlemen walks down the corridor. A young person's hand reaches out. I remember walking down the corridor. You could feel the buzz. You could feel your heart. To hold on to the arm of another young person. I can be the way I want to be and plan my future here. And I just remember being so happy I'd had that opportunity to become a new person. In memory of Joe Lanton, MBE, 1928 to 2017.